me show these suckers how to ball out here. Oh, man, let's get this together here. Oh, layup. Oh, shot. Oh, three. Three. Oh, it's like Brick City out here. Mid-range. Oh, my goodness. I can't buy a bucket out here. I missed the whole damn basket. Oh, my goodness. What's going on, man? My game is looking trash. Rat. Oh, here we go. Black Power Media shirt. Now we cooking. Now we cooking. Tree. Tree. I'm taking all three of y'all with these right here. Between the legs. Oh, my goodness. Behind the back. Layup. Oh, did he just do a reverse? He is in beast mode out here. I ain't got to look. It's falling. Oh, my goodness. This guy is going. Three, two, one. Kobe. Nice. Black Power Media, baby. Nice. Empower yourself. Go get me some of that Black Power Media again. Right here, blackpowermedia.org. Yep. I mix what I like, what I like, what I like, what I like, what I like. What's up, world? Welcome back to I Mix What I Like. Jared Ball, your host, expecting Daruba at any moment, but just in case and in the interim, uh, feel free to jump on in, like, share, subscribe, think about how you might want to support the platform, and... uh, We'll see if he's still able to join us. Now, that said, uh, what I will at least do is share what I believe is already in the show description, which was, well, actually, let let me look at what he was saying to me this morning. that he would want us to deal with the impact and effect on black radical organizations, i.e. the BPP to radicalism in this case on the subsequent social and political development, black mainstream politics today. That is the impact, I suppose, of the case of the Panther 21. Um, so he, Daruba also said that he, he requested that we broadcast on this day that 55 years ago, the NYPD's Bureau of Special Services boss swooped down on 21 members of the NY, excuse me, New York chapter, the Panther, Black Panther Party in a pre-dawn raid across the city and pre-dawn raids across the city. This was a public beginning of the infamous New York Panther 21 conspiracy trial. Only 13 members of the New York Panther Panthers actually stood trial. Among them were Daruba Ben Wahad, Afeni Shakur, Sundiata Akoli. The Panther 21 conspiracy case at the time would become the longest and most expensive conspiracy trial in the history of the Manhattan Attorney's Office under the tutelage of celebrated District Attorney Frank S. Hogan. It would ultimately mark his most humiliating defeat of his career. The Panther 21 case, as it would come to be known, became a cause celeb of America's anti-Vietnam War and race anti-racist New Left and would highlight the public criminalization of the black radical movement by the then covert FBI counterintelligence program and the federal government's collaboration with the local police agencies, with local police agencies to kill and imprison black revolutionaries. The indictments of Bobby Seale, chairman of the BPP in New Haven, Connecticut, for the FBI. The indictments of Bobby Seale, chairman of the BPP in New Haven, Connecticut, for the FBI contrived murder of Alex Rackley and his subsequent trial in Chicago, along with the anti-war radicals known as the Chicago Seven, the murder of Chicago Panther leader Fred Hampton, all followed within a year of the New York Panther 21 conspiracy indictment. The killings of Jonathan Jackson at the Marin County Courthouse, the indictment of Angela Davis and her subsequent capture and trial, the murder of George Jackson in the California Gulag, all followed in the wake of the defendants two years later in May of 1971. 
This legal repression and criminal persecution of the black and white radicalism of the late 60s gave rise to the Black Liberation Army and the Weatherman Underground of the 70s and 80s, as well as the imprisonment of scores of black, white, and indigenous radicals like Daruba bin Wahad, Leonard Peltier, Sundiata Akoli, Sekou Odinga, Matulu Shakur, and forced into exile Asada Shakur, Michael Sedaweo, Tabor, and Puerto Rican nationalists. From all day, from that day in April to this day, there are still black and indigenous political prisoners in jail. Mumia Abu Jamal, Imam Jamil Al Amin, H. Rap Brown, Kamal, that is H. Rap Brown, Kamal Siddiqui, Veronza Bowers, Leonard Peltier, and others. The last of the generation of the loud, end quote. That from Daruba. And I'll see if he's still going to join us. Uh, and if not, I am happy to hang out for a minute if anybody wants to, to raise any comments, questions, queries, conundrums, catechisms, cacophony, calumny, consternation. But this is, let me just see if he's, if we're still on. How do I know which one it is? Mm-hmm. All right, good people. Apparently, we got it together. Uh, yeah, in the meantime, make sure you like, share, subscribe, support the channel any way you can. Where else would you get all day Daruba? <laughs> Yo. And maybe I thought we had it straight. But um, I would also want to know where else, seriously, is anybody else, uh, uh, is any other, ser in, in all seriousness, and I, and I actually don't even mean this to be as petty as I'm sure it's going to come across, but does anybody know of any other platforms covering this issue today? And then to the extent that they are drawing the connections already drawn by Daruba from not only his own experience, but to the to to the current currently held political prisoners. Because uh, I do watch a lot. I do scour. I, I mean, to you, Yipper, everything I do comes comes across a certain way. Um, and maybe it's accurate. 
but I, I would be curious to know, I mean, because I look at a lot of platforms and I don't see them. I, I see this, the, 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 the differences as, as, as stark as they as they could be observed. But uh, but. Daruba, welcome back. It's good to see you again. Yeah, I'm here, man. Here we go. <laughs> yeah. So, you gotta, so you gotta I gotta get rid of that pessimistic shit you was telling me, man. Because I don't, I don't appreciate that coming from you, man. You making me depressed with that shit. I ain't gonna mention it on air, but you making me depressed. You're not gonna man. mention you on air what you've mentioned on air, Daruba. We got issues, man. I'm mention. saying. I mean, I'm saying, I don't know what to do. Are we on the air now? We're on the air. We are on the air. We're live on air. We're live on well, air. Well, I don't want to talk about that, man. I want you so to we're not going to talk thing. about it. We're not going to talk. We don't have to talk about no, it. We gonna, I mean, we. I'm happy to talk about no, it with gonna, you later. You could talk about <laughs> it on the down low. But, but right now, man, you know, first, I'm, 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 I'm glad to be on your show, man. You know, I always am. And you always you always bring profound shit to the table, you know. And you put me in a context that I wouldn't otherwise be in. Brother. You know, you had me talking to, to 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 folks I wouldn't otherwise you know talk to, you know, uh, because they they are they they got different pay grade and intellectual acumen higher than mine, brother. So so you know, um, you know I value. I mean, we've been doing this shit ever since you got kicked off. Off the off, uh, off that studio at over Angela, man. You know, so no, no, no. Just to be clear, just to be clear, <laughs> just to be clear, <laughs> let, and and just to be clear, I've I've as as my attempt at at journalism and broadcasting goes way back before that, and starts with my favorite efforts, which did involve you indirectly because they involved playing excerpts of your speeches on mixtapes and putting boom mm -hmm. bat beeps underneath them trying to put interviews around it to 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 uh uh incorporate it into what was ever being said at the time uh mm -hmm. and then and then uh and then similarly shout out to 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 the whole pirate radio community and radio CPR and WPFW <laughs> And Pacifica, all of that predates the real news where we ran into that issue because because I think you brought a very accurate analysis that was critical of of uh, and, and and I and at the time I didn't even think it was that severe of 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 Angela and a little bit of Amy. Well, but, but but Joy but Joy James but Joy James with her erudite and and and, and, and that's just as bad, man. She all the shit that I that I capsulized, encapsulated. Girlfriend broke that down in a in you know. It's <laughs> you see what I'm saying? You see yeah. what I'm saying? she broke it down in, in deconstructing Angela Davis, and 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 what did I say back then? It was it was about the encapsulation. A radical armed struggle and how she became an icon. I mean, it was true. But girlfriend put it in such terms and in such depth that you can't hate on her and you can't look like she was hating on, on girlfriend. You know, she was just breaking it down, talking about how she evolved and how and how the conditions helped bring her to the point where we look at her as the icon of a of, of revolutionary struggle when she was never that at all. Yeah, but with yeah, all due respect, but with all due respect to, to Dr. James, that's not what got me in trouble. What got me in trouble was you, you, you said it was one of my favorite things. I've, I've one of my favorite things of the many that you've said is that you said you you condemned Amy Goodman and Angela Davis claiming Asada's innocence, and you were saying don't take away that sister's agency and the political clarity with which she worked. And you said you trained with her, and you said she's a better shot than you. <laughs> oh man, I hope you heard that. I think he froze up. But that was the line that got me in trouble with the real news. Uh, forever to this day, they still got my stuff blocked. <laughs> Ha, ha, ha. 
had me in arguments in the office. The only time in my quote unquote journalistic career that, that are, no, there are two times that I've been censored uh, or, or one time, that was the one time I was fully censored. The only other time I remember journalistically being rewritten was when a white woman journalist who had been hired by the School of Journalism to, to run the journal that we were, we were putting together in the College of Communi in the, in the School of Communication took out a line of my, my article that was drawing a parallel between a critique of black journalists saying celebrities are taking their jobs in the journalism community and celebrity journalists taking the jobs of faculty and academics in the academic community. She took that line out. All right, Daruba's back. So anyway, I don't know what you heard, yeah, but I was just I was just resetting the fact that 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 I was just clarifying that it wasn't Dr. James that got me in trouble. It was what you said. <laughs> With all well, due respect, I be getting everybody in trouble sometimes. I got my I be getting myself in trouble. That's why my that's why my ex lawyer and my best friend be telling me I got to run everything past them before I print it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, because there's no statute of limitations or some of the shit that I be talking about, you know, so, yeah. Well, I I, I, I can appreciate that he would offer that, you know, that that warning or that hesitation. Uh, you know, one of the things that it, it, I read out breaking, the statement you sent. Why are you breaking up? I, know, I, can, I, I think you're breaking I, up because of the, the Red Sea cut. Because of the... Cut the, uh, the uh, the, the 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 underground damage to the to the to the um to the network to the to the to the cable that's coming to West Africa because you be breaking up. Can you hear me clear? I hear you. I don't and and I think yeah. Am I, I you, am I breaking up to you too? No, but I'm, I don't think I'm you not hear breaking me up. though. I hear you. Or you're hearing I hear you, but sometimes or is it a delay? You, you, yeah, I hear you. No, it's not a delay. It's, it's sometimes, you know, you get gobbled for a second and whatever. And I know what that is. That's that's because you're in the first world and I'm in the third world. And, and the underground, the underground uh, cable, the, under sea, the underwater cable was cut in the Red Sea. You know, they're trying to put it on the Houthis, but you know who did that. Same ones that did the Nord Stream pipeline, you know. Same ones that sabotaged that, you know. So wait a minute. The so one that the, the cut Africa in the Red has, Sea is the... The cut in the Red Sea is the same one that was cut that affected the West Coast of Africa? Or this yeah, is a, something yeah, new? Yeah, the West Coast of Africa, yeah. Mm. No, that's the, just, just that cut. I, it was about, what, two weeks ago? Mm -hmm. and, you know, um, I mean, man, everything was down here for a minute. If, you know, the first thing that came back up, of course, was the banks to, could take your credit card. <laughs> that's the first thing that got back yeah. online. <laughs> <laughs> but and then you had to I had to go to five star hotels, man, just to get just to get on the internet, you know? And, and yeah. And and they said it's gonna take five weeks to bring it back, five weeks to two months. But meanwhile, you know, the 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 the, the, the internet in Ghana, Cote d'Ivoire, uh Ivory Coast, uh, Cote d'Ivoire's Ivory Coast, Togo, Nigeria is intermittent. Sometimes it blacks out altogether. And you know, only thing that I've been able to get consistently has been YouTube. You know, some of the Google stuff comes through, but everybody else, not so much. <laughs> you know, so yeah, so that's what they claim. They claim it was some type of damage, whether they try to make like it was benign damage, like somebody dropped the anchor on the cable or something like that. But I don't know about all of that. Yeah, I read that yeah. they were trying to claim that it was it was uh, some something uh, some natural occurrence in the in the in the seabed. Uh, yeah, but, yeah, know. they were trying to so, make like it was the fish that did it. <laughs> you know, <laughs> the fish did it. <laughs> King kingfish did it. <laughs> you know, yeah, man. So so, so, so I, I read. So, I read the statement you sent a, a number of us this morning to to read uh, regarding what what today's anniversary represents politically. 
so I was wondering if, if you wanted to start with, because I, I was I, I picked up initially on the point that you're making that I think is a major concern today, which is the direction of radical organizations and the the what for me is the uh, uh, the major problem of a, a sort of capture of the of of defining radical responses or revolutionary responses to current conditions. So when you draw a connection from the Panther 21 to continued imprisonment of political prisoners, what are you trying to say that that means as you would be talking to today's activist community? Well, that, well, that, in, that, that the strategy of, of the status quo, the strategy of those in power to encapsulate and neutralize and marginalize genuine revolutionary organizations and, and movements is an ongoing process. It's, it's, it continues, it develops with technology. Um, we could see the weaponization of data and algorithms that are used to, um, to, 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 to deconstruct radical thought to, to divert um, um, radical organizations to co-opt um, um, uh, 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 to co-opt the energy of people who are looking for radical changes you know I mean you know we we went back and forth over this just about the hashtag movements for the last two years you know you and I went back and forth over that and and one of the things that I think one of the things that that, that, that I value, about you, Jared, is that you are a product in more or less of this whole called hip hop generation. And you have to, and, 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 but your look at it and your approach to it is completely on a whole different level. You know, you're not looking at it just, I mean, you, you, you understand the aesthetic of the, of, of, of the art form that it represents, but you also understand how it evolved out of black, out of black music and how it evolved out of black culture. And so therefore you're able to show how it could be diluted, could be diverted, and how that plays itself out even on, in black studies and on the academic level. You see, I look at how we look look at how critical race theory, which is not even taught as a subject matter, it's, it's just an analysis of the white supremacist construct of, of America, has been turned against us and been used by the very a fascistic and reactionary white supremacist against us. The same way when we used to talk about being woke. Four years ago, if you talk about being woke, it was about consciousness. Now you got to struggle about that. Look how they how they how they deal with um with CIE, with 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 with, with um with uh, uh um you know uh I mean, look, I was just reading today, you know, about this this piece of dog doodle uh, Miller, who used to be in um in Trump's administration, the architect, this this racist dog was talking about his job was now he done wrote a whole paper and got a whole position for Trump that when he gets reelected, how to deconstruct every civil rights game as 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 as, as anti-white. And and oh, right, and, Stephen and, Miller, and, and right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Is Stephen Miller that piece of dog awful, you know? So, so I mean, you know, I mean, ain't nobody punk slapped this dude, man. He's supposed to punk slap this white boy. He's, you know, all these so-called gangsters just flexing they in the drill music, they flexing their pieces and stuff. They, they, they didn't go up and pistol whip that cracker. You see, you got to talk with a wide jaw. He ain't gonna be yeah, that, that Look at this punk. Look at this dude. You can see that Credited when he was in college, the he was racist and draconian immigration policies. Yeah. And, Trump, and, yeah. and, 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 and and you went to college. You know, if, if you ran into that cracker when he was in college, man, talking that that conservative stuff about how he wanted to that that that, that the demonstration was blocking his classes, man, they had to put a foot in his ass. You see. But but he gets credit, all, and all of these dudes, you know, they all have the same type of character as the orange man. You know, the Spurto. What was it? The spur, the, the 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 how he evaded the draft, how he evaded military service. Talking mm -hmm. about he had oh, a spur right, on right, his right. foot. Right. Yeah, all of these dudes are cowards, man. Yeah, they all yeah. cowards. They all cowards, and they hide behind the bluster of these racist 
a, a military military and, and, and police figures. Remember that other knucklehead with the, the way the cowboy hat talking about he was a sheriff. What was his name? The black dude. Our, our pot. He was oh, speaking the, the truth. Yeah, the black dude that was that was going around speaking to Trump rallies and all this stuff and had all these fake medals on his chest. He used to wear uh, a cowboy this, hat. Who was this? Somebody in the oh, chat. Oh, you ain't missed it. You know who I'm talking about, man. He was supposed to have been a sheriff, you know. And and, and <laughs> over these dudes, man, these all these dudes, you know, they derive their manhood and they derive their virility, you understand, from power. You know, from their from their relationship to 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 the state and power. You David see? Clark Jr. Is that, David, is that who you're talking about? Yeah, that's that, yeah. yeah, that's Thank that you, Aaron. The chat the chat never lies. You know? The chat is never wrong. You, you see what I'm saying? And, and, and we need to know that there's a relationship between being a coward and being a white supremacist and being a white and, and, and being an advocate see, of white supremacy. And this cowardness is not just physical. It's a cowardness of the spirit, of the soul, of refusal to, to, to stand for anything and fight for anything other than what the power structure could 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 provide you with and and give you protection uh, with, you see, this is why you even see in, in in Israel, man, in 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 Palestine, the the difference between the Palestinian uh, freedom fighters and their courage and them going up against the IDF, and how how much punks those knuckleheads in the IDF are. They used to beating women and children and stopping them from moving and, and pistol whipping and shooting people. But when it comes up to getting in the getting in the trenches, dealing with guerrillas, they punks, man. Serious punks, and 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 so I just when I use the word punks, I'm not just talking about physical cowardness. I'm talking mm -hmm. about a cowardness of the soul, cowardness of, of people who refuse to relate and even it, expand on their own humanity, man. You know, and 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 so when you ask me a question about how does that play itself out, how does the continuation of what happened in the '60s and '70s plays itself out, we could take each episode whether it's LBJ's war on, on poverty or, or Nixon's war on drugs. And we could see that in each one of these phases, it was the cowards that came forward advocating the most draconian and the most extreme measures. When it came, when, when black folks were, 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 were burning down the cities every summer, they were talking about, we in for another long, hot summer. You know, this went on for a decade, you know? How did they deal with that? LBJ came out and said, you know, well, maybe them Negroes is burning things down because they ain't got no investment there. Ain't nothing there belong to them. Let's give them something. Let's get it. Let's talk about a war on poverty. And oh yeah, and what did it bring out? It brought out the black cowards. It brought out the poverty pimps. It brought out the black capitalists. Huh? They became the heroes and sheroes of the black community and the individual accomplishments became the, uh, the criteria by which we should judge our behavior and, and our successes. And individualism has been promoted and black capitalism has been promoted ever since. That entrepreneurial spirit, like an intre the great entrepreneur was some brave freedom fighter, you understand, who, who fought against all odds in order to open up a car dealership. Seriously, you see, who fought discrimination, you understand, and, and got on the board of directors of, of, of a major top five corporation. And he'll tell you when he does his interview, I, I went, you know, I came up from hum humble beginnings and I fought against racial discrimination and I went to a black HBCU. Look at me now. Yeah, look at your punk ass now. You see, you realize that you had to be accepted by the status quo. You realize that you had to have the back of white supremacist um, 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 endorsement of your achievements in order for you to be something. You couldn't be nothing to no ordinary welfare mama. You couldn't be nothing to no ordinary person on the street. You couldn't be their hero or shero, you see, because you a coward. And, 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 and so people misinterpret when, when we look at the radical movements of the 60s and see how certain people came out of that, that we look at today as icons of that movement, you understand? When in fact, they were 
They were not that at all. They were, they were attempts to encapsulate in, uh, uh, those movements. They were icons to, to, to divert people from real revolutionary struggle, from real love of black people, from real sacrifice, you see? And, 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 and when you ask me, does, it, does that COINTELPRO continue today? Yeah, it's under a different name, but it's the same address. You know, it's it's the same old, same old, but it's a different address. It's They're using different techniques, you know? And one of the techniques is what we're using right now, just to communicate, you see? I mean, you know, you could just a click of a button, you can go to a whole host of radical, so-called radical philosophers and, and podcasts, giving up their analysis of what black people are suffering on and, and all of this stuff. We had back in the day when the Black Panther Party was on the streets, we had to go knocking on people's doors to give them a leaflet. We had to talk to them as they came out the subway. We had to live with them in their in they tenements in order to get them to see that resistance was something that we had to do. And then we had to stand in front of them and fight for them. And they respected that. Now you don't have to do that. You see, you can you could become Charlemagne the God. You know, interview Candace Owens, and people will be talking about how you're dealing with diversification, diverse opinions, and the diverse uh, um, uh, uh, complexity of, of, of Black people. You know, we're not a monolith. We need to be a monolith. You know, we need to be organized. Well, but, but she got fired by the white adult. boys, so she she's now she's now acceptable as part of. She can now come back to. The oh, she's going to have her own. She her, her OJ generation. <laughs> Yeah, getting fired by white folks, given given how she how, how she exited stage right, you understand? She's gonna have her own following, her own podcast, and before you know it, she's gonna be a black conservative voice in the black community. Oh, I think she and already got picked up. Well, Candace Owens. Yeah, and she gonna people gonna be talking about well, Candace Owens got a point. That's what they're gonna be telling you about. Well, she got a point. Just like when, when black capitalism came out of the war on poverty, the, the next thing that they had to deal with was how black people was tearing up cities because of police murder and police brutality, and they didn't want to take it no more. And we was about to take to the streets with guns and say, what did they come up with? Black on black crime. Well, don't talk about the police doing nothing. We ain't dealing with our own family. We're killing each other. There it is. Yep. We're still struggling against that today. Every black elected official that supported all of those criminal, all of those anti-crime bills and omnibus crime acts were people that were sitting in black caucuses today. They supported that. They supported the Hillary Clintons and the Bill Clintons and that piece of dog shit Biden. They supported them and their crime bills talking about, you know, all black people need, we need a war on crime. And what did that bring us? Militarized police and the police state. It brought us fascism, democratic style, democratic fascism. You know, the, the, the omnibus crime bill, mandatory sentencing and all of that stuff fed into that. And it was black misleadership class that came out the war on poverty, the poverty pimps that transitioned into our political misleadership class. You see, and they did that in real time, and they did that in my lifetime. It ain't like I'm talking about something abstract. I watched this happen literally before my very eyes. I watched it. I watched the Maxine Waters and all of them matriculate into spokespersons for black people. And she got to, you know, she she wears, you know, she looks like a Baptist, like, like the typical sister in the Baptist church, and she's talking military. Maxine Waters stands up for black people and talking truth to power. Get out of here with that, man. And, but that's sort of what I'm getting at here by, by asking you, you know, because because it's like it's it, you, you mentioned my generation. It's like it's my generation's turn to watch it in real time happen. Watch people uh, uh, come up from various ranks of our of our uh, political or politicized spaces and accept invitations to various platforms, certain politics to certain uh, uh, positions of nominal power, and it's it's wild. It's it's wild to even if even as it feels almost like that 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 uh, the 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 off used metaphor of 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 seeing a car accident happen in slow motion, but you you just 
you're powerless to stop it. Yeah. You just see it happen. Uh, mm-hmm. um, but so real quick, if I've been meaning to ask you this for a while now. I, I for me, this was a little, I admit it was a little odd. And I want to see if we could put this in the context of, of what we could learn from the, 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 the Panther 21 experience that, that, that you can speak to. About 20 plus years ago, I was in, in, a, in an organization. And one of the leaders of that organization called me to a, a, a one-on-one and asked me if I thought someone else in our organization could be an agent. And I didn't really have, I was, I was like, I don't, I don't, I don't see any reason to, you know, and then nothing ever happened from that. 20 plus years later, I run into the person that this person acute was, was, was suggesting to me could be. And this person said to me that that initial person as it turns out, had done a whole bunch of shady stuff to them. Not knowing personally, I couldn't personally verify either of their versions. And that's sort of what I'm I'm wanting to ask you about in the context of today's activism, your experience with the Panther 21 and beyond. How, how do you think those concerns should be engaged if at all or or what what do you think could be learned from from like experiences well let me uh, let me throw this at you um when i when i first went to prison as a political prisoner in 71 and um you know 73 when that when i went upstate i ran into a brother by the name of um, <clears throat> Jazz Hayden. Now, Jazz would later become a very well-known organizer uh, in the prison movement in New York. You know, he just recently passed away. And when I first met Jazz, <clears throat> I was I had my blankets and everything. I was just being processed into the prison, and they locked down the gates. They closed all the gates. And Jazz was a dude that had little of little stature. He wasn't a big guy, you know. And Jazz was wailing on. He was beating the crap out this dude in the middle of the cell hall in the middle of the prison, right? And they called the goon squad and dragged him off and dragged him out. He wound up in the isolation unit next to me, right? And one of the things I learned from Jazz was that when somebody did what they did to you and said, you know, beware this other person that they probably an agent, Jazz used to call him over to, said, tell me, tell, tell him what you said to me about him. Tell me that. And if the dude started stuttering, Jazz would slap it. Listen, they'd be fighting right in front of me. I'd say, damn, Jazz, what happened? If you can't tell him what you told me, you I got a problem with you. You see? And that same guy that approached you to say you beware of so and so, you if 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 you had that street mentality, that gangster mentality from the streets, that's what I would have said. That you, that's what you would have said. You just say, excuse me, you want to come over here? Tell him what you just told me. Then you would really right. find out who was telling the truth. You see, we don't do that. You see, we don't do that. And 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 this is what I meant about a face-to-face relationship. That's one of the things that was one of the, the major principles of the Black Panther Party, that we had to have a face-to-face relationship with the people, that the people had to know exactly what we stood for and what we stood against. That's why the, one of the most important uh, instruments of the Black Panther Party in this organizing was this newspaper. You see? But that's how important it was. And that we had, and, and in our newspaper, on every occasion, we had to do what we learned in political education classes every day. We had to draw a clear demarcation line between ourselves and the enemy. So everybody knew who was our enemy and where we stood, you see. And where we stood had to be based on the interests and the social conditions of our people. And where did we get that from? We got that from the people themselves. Huh? This is what was meant that the people were the leaders in the Black Panther Party, you see? 
It wasn't us reading Mao and deciding that this was this was the ideology we were going to impose and come out and say off the pig. Nah. You know, this is why you see, even when you look at 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 at, at at the artistry, at the art of, of the Black Panther Party. We didn't, the, pig, the pigs were a metaphor for oppressors, for exploiters, for opportunists. This is why the, you would have a landlord that was dressed as a pig with flies buzzing around his head, just as you would have a banker dressed with a suit and tie with a pig head and flies buzzing around his head. It wasn't just cops. To be a pig to was to have a certain type of mentality and attitude towards people and power, okay? And we had to draw a clear demarcation line between that and us. And if we read Mao, Mao would reinforce that. Every movement reinforced that, okay? Mao said, whatever the enemy oppose, we oppose. Whatever they oppose, we oppose. You see, and you've said that many times when you were analyzing something and you had a problem with that. You would say, man, this is, you know, I don't know about this right here, man. They're talking this, you know, it, 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 you, you had to question it because you have a certain set of principles and attitudes and, and you have tried to draw a clear demarcation line between your morals and your ethics and your politics and that of the moral amorality and amora and, 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 and non-ethics of your of our enemy. And that's the I learned that from Jazz Hayden in that simple confrontation. Tell him what you said to me. And how many times you challenge people that critique your writings and tell, you know you come on on here and, and pop that shit. You understand? I mean, come on, let, let, let's talk about Well, I've been quoting you, I mean, I, I think it's, I want to say it's like 15 years ago already that, that I've been referencing something you said, uh, um, you said at one point, everything that's not a strategy or a tactic should be on the table. Everybody should know what everybody thinks about everything up to the point of, 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 of tactics and strategy. And more or less, I think that's correct. And so, uh, you, yeah, that's because and I, that's yeah. because that's because this all that's not real is camouflage. That's what that's mm. what Imam Jamil Alamin said. Brat Brown, he said, all that's not real is camouflage. If 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 we if once we do that, then we have no un unreasonable expectations of each other. You see what I'm saying? We know what the other person's limitations are. So if we get involved in a situation where we want to organize a united front, we know that certain people aren't going to take this united front to a certain level because that's not how they are. That's not how they that's not that's not how they roll. You see? You wouldn't back in the days when in, in the Black Panther Party, you wouldn't send me to a meeting to negotiate with the police. You know, why would you send me? You have to send somebody, you know, that could actually talk to them. If you didn't want to negotiate with them, and we wanted, if we wanted to be deadlocked, then you send me. <laughs> you see, so it's a fake negotiation. You see what I'm saying? Because you know that this guy, man, why did they send this guy? You see what I'm saying? Or oh, this sister, why did they send her? You see. So, so what I'm saying is that's why we talk about. This is why you see. The, the, uh, the police and the agents of, of, of repression were so dastardly afraid of these black power conferences, of our, of our relationship, say, the cultural nationalists, you understand, who thought that black faces was in high places was sufficient, that skin color was sufficient. OK, and the Black Panther Party had a class analysis back when cultural nationalism was at its height. OK. So what happened? Many of it, if you look at just the dichotomy in the Black Panther Party between the East Coast and the West Coast, most of the East Coast Panthers had African names. Most of the West Coast Panthers didn't. And the West Coast Panthers, of course, having to deal with people like, like Ron Karanga and cultural nationalists and the, bitter, and the bitterness between them, looked at anybody that had a cultural name and was wearing a dashiki and had an afro as probably being a cultural nationalist. But that wasn't true. What was the home? Where was the home of the Black Renaissance? It was in Harlem. Where did Malcolm teach? It was on 125th Street and 7th Avenue in Harlem. Harlem was the... Was, was was the cockpit of black 
cultural renaissance, music, and writing was hollow. This is why the Panther 21 case was so important to the system because it was meant to run the Panthers out of hollow. It was meant to criminalize us and demonize us in the cradle of black culture where Marcus Garvey had parades, where Malcolm taught it, were taught. Where, where, where Pan-Africanism grew to maturity. And it didn't grow to maturity <clears throat> on, in Los Angeles. Why? Because in, the, in San Francisco, why? Because if we go into the history of how black people moved to that area, how, how black folks were brought to the Bay Area during the height of the, of, of, of the war, during the height of, of, of bling, bringing black folks there to, to support the war in the Pacific. They came there in the 40s, in the late 40s, in, in 40s and 50s, and they came from Arizona, from Arkansas, from Texas. And who came along with them? The same crackers that were in the police force. You see? But New York was completely different. You see? New York was completely different. Even the gangsters out on the West Coast were different than the gangsters on the East Coast. We had Bumpy Johnsons. We didn't have no, 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 no Hollywood Harold. You see what I'm saying? We had Bumpy Johnson. When Bumpy Johnson died, his funeral was like the president died in Harlem. And he was a gangster. You see? We've always had a sense of peoplehood, a sense of being a people, a culture, and uniqueness on the East Coast. And that, and that could be said, too, in other areas on the East Coast, whether it was Philadelphia, with the exception of Boston, which was basically, you know, a cop city. You see? So what I'm saying, these differences in how we migrated to different places in America determine our social character, our social being, what type of organizations that, 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 that we fomented and brought together and built. You see, and so therefore, bringing bringing our positions and our and our arguments and our and, and our differences to the table and openly discussing them was an essential part of building unity, not uniformity. You see, so that goes right back to the simple principle of of of, of a black man in prison. You know who taught me that when somebody comes to you and says, well, you know, Jared is on some shit, man. You know, you know, he might be agent. You see, first thing I'm going to do, hey, Jared, do you know so-and-so? Yeah, tell Jared what you told me. And, and don't start stuttering, because I'm, because now I think, now I think, oh man, you tried to play me. Don't start stuttering, bro. You understand? Jazz didn't let them stutter. As soon as they started stuttering, they were there. They was he he would smack. They be fighting right in front of me. I said, "Whoa, whoa! What is all of this about?" You see what I'm saying? So don't stutter. You didn't stutter when you told me this. Don't stutter now that he's here. But I, I, I didn't mean it that way. What I meant was, hey, that ain't how you conveyed it to me, bro. Yo, why you tell me that then? You see what I'm saying? It's very, mm -hmm. very simple. And the enemy knew that. That's why they always try to encapsulate certain characters and individuals in the movement, play to their to, to their weaknesses, play to their vulnerabilities. Look at the snitch. You know, look, look at the movie. You might you were talking about how movies always gonna come out about icons and our struggle. They're gonna keep coming out. Because as we delve more into our radical history, stealth history is going to produce the type of, of, of characters that each generation could relate, could relate to, you see? So when, when we were talking about Fred Hampton, the movie was about the snitch. You see, recent The Big Cigar, whatever you was talking about, the movie wasn't about Huey. The movie was about the white man that supposedly facilitated Huey going to Cuba. Do you think Huey That's P. Newton like. needed the white? Do you think Huey P. Newton, who founded the Black Panther Party, you understand, needed a white man, corporate white man, to, to have entree to the Cuban Revolution? As much as they admired, they took our comrades in exile, okay? Eldridge went into yeah, but see, that's sort of my point. The way the way they're looking to frame the way it looks like the the movie is being framed. That's the point, though. They're they're 
they're they're they're taking any revolutionary context of the relationship between the Panthers or Black liberation in general to to the Cuban Revolution and reducing it to uh, uh, someone escaping the 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 murder of a of a young black woman who's riddled with you know and 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 you know on on a on a cocaine binge with potentially his his white male lover helping him get to you know that's what they're turning it into that's my point like it's not so 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 when you say do you do we think he would have needed that to get entree to the cuban revolution clearly not but that's not the version that 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 society is going to get and that's that's sort of where where my broad concern about not only how popular media but pop but even you know relatively popular scholarship but, will re look to to reassociate certain liberal politics with revolutionary history but that's but 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 you see that's that's because we you know we build up our heroes and sheroes as these iconic figures who don't have feet of clay, who don't have weaknesses, who don't have human frailties. Whatever you want to say about Huey, whether he was a cocaine addict or a criminal in 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 before his before his death, you cannot remove the the significant role Huey played when he stepped inside of history. You can't never take that away from him. You see, and the fact that he could that 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 for some a whole bunch of reasons could not maintain that through his lifetime only means that those imperfections overcame what we looked at as the perfect as the perfect revolutionary at that time. I mean, you and you went through the and we had this conversation how when you wrote about Manny Marable and and how he portrayed Malcolm X. And how he was trying to basically, and, and, and how out of that whole thing, you know, was coming that Malcolm X was basically gay. You see what I'm saying? And 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 all of that. And 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 so to defame, to denigrate, to 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 reduce to human, to 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 um to um to to human context. To, to human vulnerabilities and frailties, our heroes and sheroes should be resisted. And it should be resisted based on what was his contribution to the black radical tradition in history at this point in time. Look how they portrayed Nat Turner as a hysterical white man. You understand? But everybody, as, 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 as Norman Finkelstein pointed out, everybody respected his intellect and his intelligence. He wasn't just some messianic uh, 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 um, a leader, you understand, who was who was having these dreams and stuff and decided he was just wanted to cut off crackers' heads and he was crazy. You mean Herbert Africa. You see Africa. what I'm saying? That's who you meant, right? Not Finkelstein, right? Yeah, but but, but normal Finkelstein, uh, or Finkel, uh, or Finkelstein, the, the one that opposes uh, uh, Israel, he talked about how when he read up on that Turner. Oh, I see. In the I context see. of... When he read up on Nat Turner on, in the context of, you know, he was cutting off white folks' heads. He was chopping babies up and all of this stuff. So how do you reconcile that, you understand, with your sense of humanity? And was that terrorism and was that wrong, you see? And they tried to reduce him as just a crazed fanatic you know, who, 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 who believed he was on some messianic mission, you understand, to destroy slavery. It was deeper than that. He was a brilliant individual. He had intellect. He had under, and everybody admired his intelligence. But you don't get that when you listen when you hear about Nat Turner, because white folks tell that story, and what they tell about is their terror and how they had to squash that terror that he engendered. You see, and 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 so what I'm trying to say is, yeah, you you have a movie, The Black Cigar, because Huey Newton had frailties. Yeah, he succumbed to certain weaknesses. We all do. I did. All of us did. But then what, But is that does that outweigh what we contributed to our people's liberation struggle? That's up for us to weigh. You see? And, and, and once we weigh that, we have to say, yeah, he was imperfect. You know? Who, who ain't? But there's one thing you can say. 
when he issued executive mandate number one and told black people to arm themselves and to stand up for themselves. And we had a right to self-defense. I don't care what he returned out to be. You can't take that moment in history away from him because we needed that then, at that time, at that moment, and at that place. You see, history may not repeat itself like I told you in the, in the thing, but it rhymes. And so where are we at now? How did we arrive at the misleadership with, with the misleadership plaque? How do we arrive in the 21st century and there's no black political party? And we're still talking about the lesser of two evils. We, we, we let a cracker, a redneck, a racist, this president right now, you understand? Go look at his track record and what he said in Congress and what he did all of his political career. And he's the president. You're going to tell us there's a qualitative difference between him and Trump and that therefore we need to back him because he's better than Trump? How could you say something like that to any intelligent black person? You see? And then you realize that when he stands up Ah, uh, man, D was cooking. Yeah, here we go. Hold on, hold and on. And his young broke people. Up there for a second. Deruby, you broke up there. Yeah, for I a know. Soon, I okay. know they, they blocked us out, bro. I saw it. I said, as so when they, Biden is invited, go. when Biden is invited by black pork chop preachers, you understand, to, 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 because he's president. And because he's the head of the Democratic Party and he's supposed to be soliciting the votes of black people for their benefit. And he stands up at a congregation in a historical black church and young people jump up and call him Genocide Joe, you know, ceasefire in Palestine, genocide. And they drag the people out of the church and the, and the rest of the church goes four more years, four more years. Ah. Four more years? Wow. Wow. These are the well, same I did see, I, black. No, sorry, go ahead. But so what, what I'm trying to say <laughs> is look at look at that congregation. Look at them. Look at who they are, what age group they are. You see what I'm saying? Just look at them and you will understand that they totally disconnected from the idea and the reality of white supremacy and, the, and, 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 and empire. They, have, they haven't got a clue. You see, they haven't got a clue. And, it's, and, 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 and we, could, we, could go, we could use this analogy over and over again. Look at the hashtag movements of, uh, after, after the murder of George Floyd. Huh? All of that energy, all of that militancy that young people brought to the streets, they're blocking up traffic. They, 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 they are everywhere in every city. They were demanding police accountability. They were demanding community control of police. And how did they co-op that? They brought, a, they brought a hashtag movement. They used the terms and the symbols of, 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 of black unity, black lives matter. They didn't say black movement matters. They didn't say black power matters. They said black lives matters. Now, how are black, when in the history of white America, in the white supremacist construct of America, when black lives matter? So you're going to tell black folk, you're going to tell white folks, our lives matter. And they're going to tell you, man, this is a question of mind over matter. Y'all don't mind and you, we don't mind and y'all don't matter. So you had blue lives matter. You know, dogs lives matter. Everybody's lives matter. But when the black and your girl Party Candace and, Ka and Kanye that, said white lives matter, <clears throat> exactly. Remember when they and wore those when shirts? The black Panther Party came, yes. But when you look at black folks, when you look at the movements of the 60s, where we drew a clear demarcation line between us and the enemy, the enemy could never co opt one slogan that we put out. When we said black power, what were they going to say? White power? When we said power to the people, what was it going to say? Power to the pigs? Huh? They couldn't co-op none of our slogans because one of Mao Zedong said that you have to put slogans forward that that distill the aspirations and the and and and, and the power and, and the powerlessness of the people, not the enemy. Black Lives Matter was a statement to the enemy about what we would like them to think about. 
Whereas we were talking about what we as a sovereign people want. We want black power. We want power to the people. We want we want uh, 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 Chicano power to Chicano people. We wasn't talking about you know Chicanos were immigrants that were taking jobs from us because we had an analysis of imperialism and white supremacy and understood that the countries that these people came from, U.S. policy had made their countries unlivable for them. That's why they were coming to the borders. You see. So when you have somebody like 50 Cent, you understand, who I might have a little respect for in some, some areas, you understand, but when he comes forward with, 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 with a people like, like, with a person like Eric Adams, who's the, this pig, you understand, this dude, top all of his life, a real piece of shit, this dude gets up and, 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 and crackers in Florida are sending migrants to New York. Talk about, yeah, let the liberals deal with them. They're putting them on buses and planes and sending them to New York and Martha's Vineyard. They're putting them on buses and planes and sending them there. And so what does he do? He's got to deal with this influx as a mayor within the construct of being the mayor of a major metropolis. So he puts them up in hotels. He gets them, you know, debit cards so they could buy food and eat every day. And here comes 50 Cent talking about not with my tax dollars. Not with my tax dollars, or you're going to give migrants a debit card. But he didn't say not with my tax dollars, or you're going to send the U.S. military into Guatemala. He didn't say not with my tax dollars, or you're going to send the U.S. military in Haiti. He didn't say that. This is how superficial these Negroes are. Look at your homeboy Ice Cube. Ice Cube talks about when he was accused of laying down with white supremacists, he was talking about how he makes his own decisions. He makes his own uh, 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 adjustments. So he's the, he's the United States of Ice Cube. Why ain't that nigga in the United Nations as a, as, as, as a, as a sovereign state? See that he don't never, he, he makes all his own decisions. Ain't nobody makes their own decisions in, a, in, in, in society. All of our decisions are determined about the, by the conditions and the social being and the way we are brought up and the way we are exposed and educated. All of our decisions is when no man is an island. So for him to say something like that, you know, I, ain't no, I, I don't need nobody to tell me who to relate to. I relate to who I want to relate to. Well, then you're an independent nation, bro. You got a mm. few ducats and some dollars from these crackers, and now you're talking about you don't need nobody to, to tell you anything, that you make your own decisions. Hmm? Mm. You see? So individualism has become the criteria by which we judge success and liberation. This is why there's always the first black this, the first black that, the first black superstar. The first one to do this, the first one to how, how many firsts are we going to keep going through in a white supremacist construct? We're going to be going, we're going to be going through this to what? To the last cracker is around. So the first black stops when there's the last cracker. You see? So what I'm trying to say is that we don't we don't understand. And this generation did never understood the black radical tradition of resistance. They never read history. They never read nothing. They never checked out anything to understand that every battle that we fighting today, our ancestors fought yesterday and won. And won. All we doing is reinventing failure. The crackers got institutional memory. They, me they remember how we fought Jim Crow. They remember how we fought the feudal system of, 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 of sharecropping. They remember how we struggled through it. And they remember how, right? So now you have a generation that they ain't, they ain't in touch with that. Talking about, I'm not my grandmother's or my grandfather's radical. I, you know, yeah. You ought to be. Then you wouldn't make their mistakes. Then you would live, you would advance their, their, their hard fought victories and, 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 and struggles. Who was it? Kwame Torre that said, when they said, well, you know, black folks fought and died for, for, for the right to vote. He said, no, no. Black folks used the right to vote to organize themselves for power. We didn't fight and die just to go to a ballot and vote for whole hum, to vote for the lesser of two evils. 
And so when you add, when we ask ourselves, why don't we have a black political party today? After all we've been through, you have to go back and look at what happened in Gary, Indiana. You have to go back and look at Jet Run, Jesse Run. You have to go back and look how every black misleadership class did everything they could to prevent black people from having a black working class political party. That's why we don't have one. That's why we told them, well, we got to vote Democrat or we got to vote Republican. And anybody that doesn't, that doesn't say that, they get ostracized. Run, Jesse, run. When Jesse Jackson, he brought all of these black people into the campaign. And what did he do? He quit and, 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 and touted the fact that he, more, he brought more black people into the Democratic Party than anybody else. When 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 um, uh, sheepdog when sheepdog um, um, what's his Bernie. name the white boy yeah Bernie. when sheepdog Bernie yeah when sheepdog Bernie you understand ran he created a, a groundswell of young people who looked at looked up to him as an alternative to the establishment Democratic Party they got behind him they was organizing in the streets they was talking about debt forgiveness for student loans they were talking about community control of police all of these things him as a social Democrat he didn't run as an independent now he didn't run as an independent he threw his independent politics out the window and ran as a Democratic candidate and what did he do? When he finished, he threw all of that to the wicked witch of the West, Hillary Clinton. And then Who, to Biden. Yeah, yeah. But look at Hillary Clinton. She thought all she had to do was resurrect the opportunist sexist dog like, like Donald Trump, because he ain't serious. You understand? And use him as a as a whipping boy, as, as a straw dog to run against, and homeboy wound up. She wound up being the straw dog. <laughs> Wound up winning. She thought that, yeah, I could definitely be a Donald Trump. So let's promote this dude. And he won. Why? Because she didn't realize that the majority of white disaffected voters were disaffected not because they were being just not neglected in Washington. They were disaffected because they felt that the United States was no longer a white Christian um, um, uh, uh, nation that it grew out of its rebellion against the empire, against the British empire. They, they were neglected. Here come Trump with his opportunist ass, comes along and told him, let's make America great again. Well, when was America great? It was a great when we were, it was great when we was, when we was in slavery, when we were slaves. That's when it was great. That's when cotton was king. That's when the U.S. accumulated this primitive accumulation of capital, was off 350 something years of our servitude. So he wants to make America great again. That should be a signal to black folks to go back to Huey Newton, arm ourselves or harm ourselves. Executive order number one. You see, because them crackers are armed and them crackers is crazy. And them crackers believe that we are the problem. And who do we believe is the problem? Migrants. They take your job. You got a Negro get on TV and say, they talking about there's no money in the black community, but why is there Asian beauty parlor na making nails? Why is there an a, a, a Asian soul food joint? He, this dude, and that's supposed to be a signal that black folks as consumers got money and they can go out there and that that money, if we had a black soul food restaurant, if we had black folks making nails in here, you understand that somehow we would have been empowered. Only thing you go, only thing that's new power in you, man, is you getting your feet scrubbed by a black person. That's it. You so, see. So, so Deruba, my bad. I gotta cut you. I'm sorry. I, I have to I'm cut sorry. you off. I, I'm, no, I'm no, sorry, no, I apologize. No, no, no. It's my fault because because uh, I'm getting messages that that our household schedule is 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 again demanded that I adjust my schedule to accommodate my children. So, so my time might get cut a little short here, but I, and I got to ask you something that, that, so I took, I agreed to, to a debate. Uh, I don't even know when this is going to be, but uh, on May 4th, I agreed to a debate with David Swanson around okay. the question. David Swanson is I'll, I'll here. I'll pull it up here. He's a, um, I actually, first heard about him years ago through uh, Glenn Ford actually had been, I think at the left forum, they had been in touch or something like that. 
but I want to ask you this question. I want to cheat and get you to give me my 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 approach to this because the question here's the exact the the debate line is the the, the topic to, to be debated is the proposition is war can never be justified. Large scale violence is never a better choice than nonviolent action. I am I am uh, arguing the the negative right that's how it's described right i, I would i would hope yeah. so <laughs> yeah i'm arguing the negative so 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 what should be the approach how should i frame my argument in defense of uh at least the concept because obviously certainly not on youtube are we advocating anything but but in defense of the concept in defense of the idea of 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 war uh, justifiable war and large scale violence being better than nonviolent action. How should, how, how would, how do you think I should approach that? Well, there's a number of ways to approach it. I would, first of all, I would say that, that, that nonviolence and violence are not politically, um, 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 opposite each other. You see, that's the first thing so that the right absence right. of violence that the absence of violence in, 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 in human struggle doesn't, doesn't, doesn't imply or negate the use of violence in order to liberate yourselves. I mean, you, if, if Hamas didn't resist the Israeli occupation of the Zionist state, they would have been kicked to the curb. And right now we'd be talking about the Abraham Accords and how every mm. Arab nation has a relationship to, 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 um, to Israel for economic uh, uh, growth and the peace and prosperity of the region. Bullshit. Mm. You see? It's, it's, it's not true. Every people have a right to resist their oppression. That's why in the United Nations, the occupying, occupying force has no right to self-defense. So using the, using the idea that Israel has a right to self-defense means that as a nation state, it has a right to defend itself against the violence of the people that is that is enslaving and that is and that's whose land it's stealing. The people have a right to resist oppression and exploitation. You see? And that and 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 then you could take it to the next level. You could take it to Sun Tzu and von Klopswitz. What is polit What is war? War is the continuation of politics by violent means. What is politics? The continuation of war by nonviolent means. So black folks have been oppressed in the United States through the use and impl and, impl and, and, and implied violence of the state. So when we were struggling for civil rights as a nonviolent um, uh, uh, movement, we were struggling for our human rights and our right to be treated as as as, as ordinary citizens through nonviolent means. That doesn't mean it was it wasn't political. Hmm? And when the Black Panther Party comes along and the Black Liberation Army comes along and says that the, that we have to exact a, exact the consequence on our enemy when they initiate violence against us, what are we going to do? We're going to come out and 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 sing, "We shall overcome." Is that what we're going to do when we know historically that that has never worked? Vietnam wouldn't be Vietnam because they didn't, if, if they didn't get the memo, they didn't get the memo that they were supposed to lose. They meant that memo shot past them. They were fighting the most powerful nation on the face of the earth with atomic bombs and everything, with an air force and everything that could bomb them into the Stone Age. But they didn't get that memo that they were supposed to lose. So they fought from one generation to the next. They built underground cities and, 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 and fought until what? Until them crackers left Vietnam hanging on helicopter skids. You see? So for an individual to say, that nonviolence and violence are the equal or the equivalent or the dichotomy of each other is totally false. Politics is the continuation of war by violent means, and war is the continuation of politics by violent means. So the first thing that I think you should say is that it's a false dichotomy that you're presenting right here. It's a false argument. That you think that because that that, that because a movement employs nonviolent against a more powerful enemy, against a more powerful system, that somehow that means nonviolence is going to achieve their liberation and their, and, their, and their freedom. That's not necessarily the case. Colonialism 
and white supremacy has never exited any colonized people by nonviolent means, never. The French are still in Africa in countries that, that is so-called abandoned and left, okay? After they destroyed every piece of infrastructure that these people had and, and signed agreements and contracts with them that would keep them in, subservient, uh, uh, in a subservient position to France for eternity. And whenever they decided, man, we don't want to do that, what did the French do? They sent the military in to depose them. They use violent means to maintain it. How would you want to oppose the military? Would you want to, you going to pray them out of the country? You were going to wish them out the country? No, you have to Lay our bodies in front of the tanks, Daruba. Lay, lay our right. bodies. Got, yeah, and let the tank run over action. your ass. <laughs> yeah, but look at Hamas. Hamas is using RPGs in order to neutralize tanks. They ain't laying in front of no tanks. And because of that, Millions of people have taken to the streets over, and the whole Zionist project is now exposed for what it is. Okay, why? Because they resisted. They resisted their oppression. Okay, that doesn't mean that every situation requires that we have to jump up and start talking about shooting and killing people. Okay, I mean, the 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 the, the moral and the eth the, the the moral. Uh, Credibility of nonviolent struggle is best epitomized in, in, in movements in which the majority of the people were fighting an external enemy that imposed themselves on them. It were more of them than the oppressor. So if the people stopped working, if the people blocked up the streets, if the people brought the economy to a halt, what did the system do? It resorted to violence. It, revor it resorted to oppression and, 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 and putting people in prison. And every repressive movement breeds resistance. And, and so I don't think that and there's no argument. I mean, when, I mean, you could use, uh, um, 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 uh, what's his name? Um, uh, Obama. The, the bomber in charge, the drone bomber in charge, you know? <laughs> he got a Nobel Peace Prize. And this man killed more <laughs> Africans than any other president on the planet mm. and in history. He, and when he, look at his speech. Mm. He, in his speech for not, for, for, in his speech about war, he's the one that said in his speech that war sometimes is necessary. And although I accept this Nobel Peace Prize, I understand that although war shouldn't be our first choice, although we shouldn't choose violence over agreement, over negotiation, sometimes it's necessary. And one of those times when it's necessary, when an oppressed people can no longer suffer their oppression nonviolently, peacefully. Go listen to Malcolm. You go back and listen to Malcolm, man. You ready? All you got to do is when this knucklehead come on your show is play Malcolm, message to the grassroots. And then just sit back, my case rests. Let him argue with Malcolm. You see? Yeah, no, it's not going to be on my show, just to be clear. It's going to be Yuri Smooter is hosting it. Uh, so, but. Uh, Who's Yuri uh, Smooter? Who, he's a good brother. Smooth? He's he's a cool dude. He, he's, a, he's a friend of the, the, of the platform here. He's doing, he's he's a good guy. Uh, I, I just, so I, I'm, I was admittedly curious and a bit fascinated by the invitation. So I'll, I'll, uh, yeah, but I figured, yeah. And, and, and the chat has, has, has accurately made clear that, uh, um, this was, you know, I already got this in my notes. Thank you, Manny, uh, BAP statement. Uh, thank you. Oh, for, yeah, Ajimu Baraka, Ajimu Baraka wrote that yeah. very clearly in a recent essay. And you, I think you should go back to and, and pull up some of that, too. Ajimu okay. really laid it on, and especially when he was talking about the difference between Western concepts of, of human rights and the concept of the global South rights of human rights and how they in conflict with each other. One is propositioned on, on violence and, 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 the, and the supremacy of the state, and the other one is propositioned on the people's needs and the supremacy of governments working for, to benefit people and not people working to benefit governments. And 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 so, I mean, the, the, 
the, I don't even know how this argument could even proceed rationally without a fundamental understanding that it's the, the state has a monopoly on violence, on legal violence. They have a monopoly. They have a mon so anybody that resists and the first and the first, you know, the, the first um, rule of the state is to survive by any means necessary. You see. Yeah, they might give us a few, you know, a few concessions. They might let us dance in the streets or walk down the streets, but let us start talking about taking that power away from them on a real basic and fundamental level. Watch how violent they get. You know, watch how they start outlawing free speech. I mean, look, look at look at look at what folks have been going through just talking about Israel as a white supremacist construct. They, they label anti-Semitic, they, they label all of this. Everybody forgets that the only Semites in Palestine are the Palestinians. The rest of them crackers come from the Ukraine and Europe. These are, that's where these Ashkenazis come from. And where did they get, where did that whole po pogrom towards, towards Jewry come from? It came from the Spanish Inquisition. It came from when, 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 when Muslims were run out of Andalusia would run out of Spain, and then you had the Spanish Inquisition, and everybody had to pledge allegiance to 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 the church, and and they were they were burned at the stake as heretics. And who were the biggest heretics in the eyes of the Christian Church back then? Jews. They killed Christ. I mean, you can't get no more demonized than that. Y'all killed the Savior. <laughs> and he died for all our sins. You all murdered the man that died for our sins. You, see? you know y'all wrong. <laughs> you know y'all was wrong. You see what I'm saying? And when and when the Muslims and the Moors were in, were in Spain, you understand. Ashkenazi or Sephardic Jews, they could open, they, they weren't persecuted and burned at the stake. But let the soon as them crackers came in, soon as they, and, and this war, this war in Spain, you know, the, the, it, it ended in 1492 with, with the rise of, 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 of the Spanish Empire and all of that stuff. That war was going on for 150 years before they actually succeeded. You see? So we need to understand the origins of anti-Semitism. The origins of anti-Semitism has always came from the fight of, for, for, for the rise of the, of, the, of the Christian white supremacist construct and state based on their religious, on, on their religious uh, dogma. It didn't come from the Palestinians. It didn't come from Muslims. It didn't come from none of them. None of them persecuted uh, 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 um, uh, Sephardic Jews like, like the Europeans did. And so the whole object of the European settler state right now of Israel was to, get, was to get them out of Israel and put them someplace else, and then we'd be rid of their ass. You see? Put them on the Palestinians. Palestinians was like, damn, why us? We, we wasn't down with, 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 with Adolf and his crew and, and Eichmann and them, man. We, you know, we wasn't down with that. And what are you talking about anti-Semitic? We Semitic. We anti-us. You guys come from the Ukraine speaking Yiddish. You see? Talk I mean, about so, it's so, our homeland. <laughs> yeah, talk about, yeah. God gave it to us. Mm -hmm. And because God gave it to us, we could do anything to keep it. They don't went completely rogue. I mean, these crackers, I mean, they don't went rogue. They bombing other people's countries and embassies yeah, and shit, yeah. all flying their territory, killing their motherfucking ambassadors. Let, hey, hey, let a Muslim do that. Let, 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 let the Afghans, let the Afghans say, man, after 20 years, y'all messed us up. We're going to blow up the U.S. embassy. We're going to blow up the U.S. embassy in this damn world. I mean, see really, what happens. It's like what they're doing is reserved for the most elite of whites. I mean, really, I can't imagine anybody outside of the U.S. and Israel doing this and getting away with it to the level that they are. Uh, uh, maybe a couple other Western European nations, depending who they chose to, to to bomb, could get away with it. But, but that's I mean, they this is like elite rogedom, uh, the, the still, highest level of rogedom. That's because it's the last European settler state project. Mm. It's the last mm. one. 
You know, there was Canada, there was Australia, there was the United States, and all of them were European settler states that broke away from the empire. And when you look at going all the way back to Theodore Herzl and the Balfour Agreement, all of that was designed to uh, as, a, as an adjunct and a contributing factor to, to British imperialism and British control of the so-called uh, uh, Near Asia or the, or, or, the, or the breakup of the Ottoman Empire, okay? So this is the last European construct. And, um, and, 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 and gladly, they, they, you know, they are destroying themselves. This is why the West is quiet. This is why they keep supplying them with, with arms and ammunition. Cause it's like, come on guys, y'all can make it. Y'all can make this work, you see? And you got Trump's son-in-law talking about how Gaza is going to be the, the the Gaza the Gaza Strip is going is, is an excellent opportunity for for Mediterranean co-ops and high rises. You understand, man? This is a great real. It's going to be a real estate uh, a market right here. As soon as you run these Palestinians out, you understand, and exterminate them all. You know, this is we good to go. You see, this is the last European settler project. And the U.S. is on board because the U.S. knows why they supported this state in 1948 and why they put it in that region to guard their interest in the Suez Canal amongst the people that they thought that was hostile and that didn't have the same religion as them. You see, that's why the Israelis are there. And the Israelis said, man, fuck it, man. If we, if we go, if it's hell below, we all going to go. So we'll bomb the Iranian embassy and tell the Iranians, yeah, what you gonna do? What you gonna do? We, a big brother right here is gonna roll with us. Go ahead, what you gonna do? You see? And the Iranians Listen, Daruba, like, you know, unfortunately, I gotta start to, to wrap up, but I wanted to ask yeah, you I'm sort sorry, of- I'm sorry, I'm sorry No, no, it's not your fault, man. It's not your fault. Believe me, I, I would have, initially, I was ready to sit here all day, but, but, but you know, Kids often need something from their parents. Who who knew? You know what I'm saying? It's crazy. Who knew? But 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 my real what I I did want to ask you sort of a, a I don't know a, my version of a of a of a of a broadly philosophical question. Uh, you know, as 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 you reflect on this 55th anniversary of the the sort of creation of you and your comrades as the the Panther 21. Just some closing thoughts on on looking back on do you, do you lessons to be learned do you do you ever have uh, uh, what might be account akin to a regret uh, in terms of 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 uh, what that any of it or 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 again just to say more on what you think how you think those today or in the future should look back on future anniversaries of the creation of the Panther 21? Well, I think, I think I, I kind of like try to encapsulate it in the stuff that I sent you that the Panther 21 case marked the, um, the, the, the public um, expression, the public outing of, 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 of the counterintelligence programs um, um, collaboration with with local law enforcement and 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 how they colluded to demonize and criminalize black radicalism. It wasn't just it wasn't just the COINTELPRO document that we ultimately read that said black youth have to be made to understand to be a revolutionary is to be a dead revolutionary. That was the essence of the Panther Twenty One case. That's what COINTELPRO wanted to achieve. You know, it wanted to show that if we stood up for ourselves, if we fought on our behalf, if we controlled our community, that we would be dead. They would kill us. They would put us in prison and they would neutralize us. And those who were talking about becoming a movie star or basketball player star, you know, they would be allowed to thrive because white folks needed them. They were entertained by them. You know, they were harmless. So. The reverse of that is, what do we have today? We don't have the Black Panther Party. We have black spokesmen for black people like 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 Fat Joe. You see, this is who we got. We got athletes and rap artists 
you know, who, who, who speak for us because the Panther 21 case showed that if you stand for, if you make a clear demarcation line between you and the white supremacist construct that is America and talk about thinking as a sovereign people with the right to self-defense, your ass is going to jail. And we'll concoct any type of, of reasoning and, and, and justification and use the media to send you to jail. The problem that what happened was is that we got a jury that actually thought for themselves and they saw through this and we won the case. So this was a major humiliation for Frank, uh, for Frank S. Hogan, who was supposed to be the premier prosecutor in the country, you see, who prosecuted mafia figures and all of this. He lost this case. And the state realized then that they were not going to bring any more conspiracy cases against black radicals, black radicals anymore. They were only going to bring criminal charges for criminal violations, and that's how they were going to do it. And every case that we've seen since then, whether it was Mumia, whether it was Rap Brown, whether it's all of these cases were criminal cases, that, not conspiracies, criminal cases. You see, and 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 so the the, the the Panther 21 case in this in this way was a watershed that 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 exposed how the state would proceed into the very near future. You know, that's what it was. That's what it represented. You see, I'm just saying that. So 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 so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was somebody calling them. So, so I, in closing, I would just say that, um, you know, we should, the lessons that we should learn from from the conspiracy cases of the '60s, you know, which has morphed into now the the seemingly apolitical RICO cases that are being that are being brought against white street gangs and, and and rappers and all of this stuff that that, that was a, 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 a legal strategy and laws that were that were in that were enshrined and put on the books to organize crime is now being used to fight the organized criminalization of black people we would now that we've been criminalized now that we've been marginalized, what what are you going to state? You're going to bring a conspiracy case against us for political reasons? No, you bring a RICO case for criminal for criminal uh, uh, reasons. They tried to criminalize us and they failed. They couldn't criminalize the Black Liberation Movement, although they tried. And although through stealth history, we see that we're still called terrorists. If you notice that back in the 60s, all during the era of the Black Liberation Army, they never called us terrorists. They just called, try to call us criminals and cop haters and all of this. Why? Because terrorism has a political connotation. Terrorism means, terrorism actually means a tactic that is used by those who do not have the wherewithal and military power of an entrenched of an entrenched state. So they use the tactics of terrorism in order to, 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 to exact their political aims on a more powerful adversary. This is why France has never got, gotten over um, the, the Algerian revolution and how it shaped France, French society ever since. You see, led to a rebellion in, 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 in France with, with with the success of the FALN, so uh, uh, and so 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 what I'm trying to say is, is that is that the Panther 21 case in its early stages as a conspiracy indictment. Look at the charges. Go look at the case. They were talking about we were going to bomb the uh, the botanical gardens. That we were going to rob Abercrombie and Finch on Easter. I mean, you can't get a cracker more mind. That man, you on the day that Christ was resurrected, you was gonna go stick up a department store. Man, y'all really evil. You see, this is what we were gonna do. We were gonna we were gonna destroy the subway system where working class people's only means of transportation is the subway. Look at the charges they brought against us. They were so ridiculous that the jury said. These people who are standing for the self-defense of black liber and, and, and black folks who are quoting Malcolm X, they weren't going to blow up the subway with black people on it. 
They were, why would they blow up flowers in the botanical gardens? And why would they go rob Abercrombie and French? Not on a weekday, but on Easter. That didn't work. And we were acquitted. You see? So now I say, oh, we get these niggas. We know how to deal with it. From now on, it's all about criminal charges. They killed the cop. They were conspired. You know, they, they, they shot up this and they did that. And here we come with new kill. New killing of police officers. Anti-urban anti guerrilla strategy of the Nixon administration to stop the growth of a black underground and the Puerto Rican um, resistance movement for independence. Okay? New kill. Out of New Kill comes Chesara, the hunt for Joanne Chesamard, you understand, for, for because she's the leader, she's the mother hen of the Black Liberation Army who are sticking up banks and taking money off of, from mom and cars. And out of that comes Prysac, prison activist movement. Because once we political prisoners, if, in, if we in prison, that's like a breeding ground for revolutionaries. You got to figure out a way to deal with that. So they come up with Prysacs. Yeah, read Tip of the Spear. And you can see all of that by Orasani Burton. Excellent suggestion. So what I'm trying to say is the, the, um, the, the, the Panther 21 case, what followed that was the rise of the prison movement, was the murder of George Jackson, was the rise of, 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 of movements that were talking about liberation and, 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 and armed struggle and armed resistance, you see? And the enemy realized that trying to criminalize us with mere conspiracy cases weren't going to get it. They had to use racketeering influence um, um, uh, 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 tactics in order to, to do that. And then we came up with what? Grand jury resistance. To resist the grand jury that was investigating um, a black liberation movement, you would go to jail until the, until the end of the grand jury cycle. But you disrupted their whole proposition that you were gonna come and squeal and talk to them about everybody because you didn't want to go to jail. Hey, look, I ain't got nothing to say, send me to jail. You see? So there were strategies that were used to resist the repression in all of these phases of, of, of government fascism and the rise of the military police state. And every tactic that we use was successful and they had to move on to a different one and they got institutional memory so they remember our successes and they remember the mistakes they made we don't have institutional memory of our radical history so we'll repeat failure we'll repeat movements that don't work We'll allow ourselves to be encapsulated and get a, a, a couple of hundred million dollars from, 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 from in grants and move out of the struggle and get a mansion on the side and say, well, look, man, we just keeping it moving. So that's what I would have to say about that. I mean, where you get that, though? That's a nice looking little puppy. That's, that's Roberto Duran. And he's. Hey, uh, man, I, if I show I you. If I show you, if I show you my dog Kimu, I happen not to be uh, in my house, but I show you Kimu. He's a Bora bull. He's a Bora bull. He's he's like twice the that dog size, and he's a he's a love bug. He loves everybody, but because of his size and the way he looks, That's a lot. you know, yeah, people people like say ah, you know, he's is he dangerous, you know, but he he's not. Yeah, anyway, no, I appreciate yeah. you, Jared. No, listen, I, listen. I, I, was, I appreciate you. It's always a pleasure, and and we, I, again, we're honored to be able to rap with you as much as we can. So, so thank you for giving the platform all this time today, and uh, uh, we'll continue to to be in support of of you in any way we can. So, so well, you could know, do the GoFundMe. You got my GoFundMe page. I'll put that in the yeah. I'll put that in the show description and and remind folks to please continue to support Daruba as best they can. And uh, absolutely, uh, uh, yeah, I'll I'll make sure that's all in there before before uh, yeah before I leave. I'll put it in there. I did forget this time to do it, so I apologize for that. But yeah, we'll definitely put the GoFundMe in there and encourage people to support you. Uh, and look to have the next time an excuse to bring you back. I mean, this is this is dope. Yeah, well, right. I appreciate that on this 55th anniversary uh, of the Panther 21 case. And um, 
I, I just hope I brought some type of enlightenment as to Please. what the significance of that case really meant, you know, Please. in terms of our radical history and radical tradition. Yeah, right on. No, of course you did, and we appreciate it. Uh, so thank you very much. Peace to you, because we know you're willing to fight for it, and we'll catch you next time, Daruba. Thanks a lot. All right. Take peace care. out, bro. All right, peace. All right, everybody, please do. Uh, I'll make sure it gets in there quickly, the, the GoFundMe link, and uh, support Daruba any way you can. Share the link with others and encourage them to do the same. Big shout-out to him, and big shout-out to all the remixers who came through today. Definitely appreciate you. Uh, and uh, and all the support and the help that for 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 my forthcoming debate, I saved this one, Yipper, because this one this one cut deep. This one cut deep. That was a little bit. That was a little bit. That was a little bit unnecessary. <laughs> all right, everybody. Peace. Only if you're willing to fight for it, like Fred Hampton used to say. We'll catch you next time here at I Mix What I Like and throughout the platform. Say bye, homie. All right. He says peace too. Peace, everybody. And what do you sacrifice? Calm, kindness, kinship, love. I've given up all chance of inner peace. I made my mind a sunless space. I share my dreams with ghosts. I wake up every day to an equation I wrote 15 years ago for which there's only one conclusion. I'm damned for what I do. My anger, my ego, my unwillingness to yield, my, my eagerness to fight. They set me on a path from which there's no escape. I yearn to be a savior against injustice without contemplating the cost. And by the time I look down, there's no longer any ground beneath my feet. What is my, what is my sacrifice? I'm condemned to use the tools of my enemy to defeat them. I burn my decency for someone else's future. I burn my life to make a sunrise that I know I'll never see. Now the ego that started this fight will never have a mirror or an audience or the light of gratitude. But what do I sacrifice? Everything! 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 Everything. Everything.